Hello, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, there was a day full of inspiring or maybe unsettling talks already. But now you are about to hear the very first um, presentation about psychism in English language. So I hope you will enjoy this premiere as much as I do. Let me give you a quick outline of my talk. I will start with an introduction to psychism before I introduce myself. I will then put the shocking full extent of psychism first, psychiatric violence and torture. With two models of oppression, I will bring psychism into the context of anti-oppression. I will then say a few words regarding the term sanism before I get into more detail with my own analytical work, which I call the psi-normative matrix. By analyzing psychism with theories of Judith Butler, I de developed three core elements of psychism. And finally, I will bring the presentation to a close with a warning about co-optation. So I will just give you a short introduction to psychism so you get a first rough understanding and uh, hopefully more in-depth insights arise uh, um, in the course of the talk. I have developed the notion of psychism about two years ago to make a form of oppression recognizable, which was till then mostly not consciously reflected, especially in Germany. That is the discrimination because of psychic suffering or non-normative perception, feeling, thinking and behavior. It is the individualization of experiences of oppression in form of pathologization, diagnostication or treatment in the psy complex, the so-called psychosocial support system. Psychism encompasses the idea of the existence of a psyche and its division into normal healthy and abnormal sick as well as the devaluation and oppression of those suffering regarded as mentally ill or not meeting psi norms in various ways. Thus, psyche is another category which is being targeted of oppression. I think it's important who speaks out about, uh, about oppression. And this is why I would uh, like to um, say a few more words about myself. I had just started um, studying anti-oppressive um, theory when I was psychiatrized. I was sectioned, restrained, and I was injected psychotropic liquids against my will. After six months of psychiatric care, um, I was sent to work in a sheltered workplace for the mentally ill and I quit after two weeks. Today I can speak out because I went to the subaltern. I am seeking help by people who are excluded from society, who fight against being forced into the parallel world of the psychosocial support sector which most of you are probably not familiar with. I was lucky to be part of progressive support groups in Berlin, the coming of psychiatric drugs group at the Association Against Psychiatric Violence and Plan B. I was also lucky to be introduced to MED studies by Jasna Russo and Elia Lüthi. These were crucial doors into my own academic um, work towards psychism. And these were ways to find words to speak out about oppression, 
which not only remains unseen by today's anti-oppressive academics and activists, but which operates with institutionalized violence to an extent that is hard to believe. That is why I cannot present my theoretical thoughts about psychism without first pointing out the shocking extent of psychiatric violence. This includes sectioning, that means forced admission and internment into psychiatric inst institutions, forced treatment, forced feeding, psychiatric restraints, isolated confinement. These are fundamentally incomp incompatible with global human rights. Schneider rem reminds us that, um, I quote, psychiatric forms of violence are classified as cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or torture. And this is done so by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. This means that there's a quality of violence which, according to Article 4 of the UN Civil Covenant, is under no circumstances permitted by the state. Despite that, psychiatric violence is still being covered by German law. And due to the involvement of the state, it fulfills the criteria to be addressed as torture. It feels surreal and disencouraging to speak of oppression while it's continually being carried out in such a violent manner through state-authorized torture. Nonetheless, I'm convinced that it will be a helpful shift to take an anti-oppressive paradigm. I use the model of oppression by Bettina Schmidt to illustrate that. As you probably know, oppression results from the differentiation and power. Also, oppression operates on different levels, the individual, interpersonal, structural or institutional, and discursive or ideology level. On the individual and interpersonal level, self-help and peer support addresses the oppression. The anti-psychiatry movement is mainly aiming at the institutional level. But as uh, Joseph points out, not all people oppressed by psychism are done so at the institution of psychiatry. So the anti-psychiatry uh, movement does important work, but it's not enough. Maybe the discursive um, level needs to be confronted more specifically. Or maybe because all levels need to be addressed simultaneously. And this is where I see the possibilities for change through anti-psychism and anti-sanism. But how to confront psychism? I use the trilematic model of, uh, uh, of anti-discrimination by Mai Anboga to make understandable uh, the contradicting mechanisms of oppression. These need to be addressed in theory and activist practice. According to Boga, there are three ways to fight oppression. There are empowerment, normalization, and deconstruction. Because of the contradicting nature of oppression, only two of these strategies can be taken at once. In the model, these two form uh, a line, one line of the triangle. And the opposite spike, however, is the third mechanism of oppression, which remains unaddressed, and therefore becomes more powerful. As you see in this table, for example, the strategies of normalization and empowerment aim at the right to fully participate in normality. But at the same time, the strategic essentialism dismisses the strategy of deconstruction. 
An example is I am trying to participate in academic uh, in the academic world full of psychist barriers and to do so I use medical certificates written by psychiatrists to take the time I need for my academic work. But in the moments I do so, um, I submit to institutional norms. I reproduce the myths of mental illnesses and therefore I dismiss their deconstruction. So I don't have the time to show this for all the three um, strategies, but I highly recommend you my Anboga's work. I hope I made understandable that it is crucial to have a notion that addresses oppression on all different levels. And moreover, the name of the oppression should open the doors to all the different uh, strategies for anti-oppression. So as I said, I uh, developed the notion of psychism and um, psychismus in the context of uh, German-speaking psychiatrically experienced, who often don't have access to the English language. Introducing my work on psychism to English-speaking anti-oppressive academics, I would like to refer to sanism because the terminology of sanism has been around for decades already. It has been coined in the 1960s and promoted by the 1990s by the law professionals Birnbaum and Perlin, who tried to fight for the right for treatment and criticized the oppression of mentally ill or mentally disabled persons. The notion has been taken on by med scholars in the last decade to na name daily microaggressions, as well as the supremacy of a sanest larger belief system. Ideas of mental illness themselves are part of this psych-centered belief system. However, I thank, to, uh, I thank uh, Christina Schrank-Dernbach for pointing this out to me. Sanism is often described as the oppression of people with mental illnesses. This makes it less probable that within the notion of sanism, deconstructing strategies are not being undermined. Another problem is that oppression, from my point of view, actually can lead to the uh, painful mental processes. As much as I want to underline the importance of acceptance and valuation of non-normative mental states, I also want to address people who suffer from their mental states. But I would like to question the origin, the origin of the so-called psychic pain. And I do so by not only deconstructing the myths of mental illnesses and the division of so-called sane, rational and uh, insa insane mental processes, but by analyzing the categorization psyche itself with deconstructing um, theories of Judith Butler. There are different understandings of the psyche. The standard psychological definition, if you find one at all, is mind and behavior. To be more precise, I differentiate mind into perception, feeling, and thinking. These so-called mental states are actually processes or actions. Then there's the idea of personality, which has a connotation of substance or essence. This might be linked to the notion of soul and more spiritual understandings. But following Butler, I would like to suggest questioning the psyche as an inner space. Butler asked in their rhetorical manner, I quote, is the norm first outside and does it then enter into a pre-given psychic space understood as an interior theater of some kind? Or does the internalization of the norm contribute to the production of internality? Does the norm having become psychic involve not only the interiorization of the norm, but the interiorization of the psyche. 
Then Butler becomes unusually explicit when they say, I argue that this process of internalization fabricates the distinction between interior and exterior life, offering us a di distinction between the psychic and the social that differs significantly from an account of the psychic internalization of norms. This does not only help us to get a first impression where a deconstructing understanding of the psyche might lead to, it also shows incongruences to gender. It shows the difficulty to grasp this psyche as socially constructed. To do so, we need to perform what I call a mental loop. While through genderism, norms about gender are internalized, through psychism, we internalize norms about internality. Or to put it another way, the construction or internalization is at the same time the construct, so to speak, the internality or psyche. In the case of genderism, uh, internalizing creates a different construct, and that would be gender. This shows that for my analysis, I am not only searching for congruences between gender and psyche, but I also like to learn from incongruences. And now I would like to get into more detail about my own analytical work. I am working with an analogy to Butler's model of the heteronormative matrix that I call the psi-normative matrix. So as I assume many of you know already, Butler developed this model to analyze the regulatory practices that govern gender. Butler shows that fictive ideas of biological sex, a, a social gender, and desire are working hand in hand to determine gender and sexual identities in limited binary ways for reproductive purposes. So I have found um, analogical terms for sex, gender, and desire with regard to the psyche. And these are physical or bodily psyche, cultural or social, social psyche, and self-desire. Desire is limited by the dictates of compulsory heterosexuality. According to Butler, the reason for this is the goal of reproduction. Analogically, the goal of a normative sane self-desire is the ability to work, to be productive in an economic sense. I thank Mo for opening my views on non psi normative self-desires, including the desire to suffer as a political practice. For the social psyche, it will be central to show how Butler theorized gender identification as an outcome of regulatory practices. For the identification with one's psyche, um, these regulatory practices constitute identity and the internal coherence of the subject, just like uh, with gender. With the bodily psyche, I would like to show more detail how I use Butler's theory to understand psychism. The hegemonic views of psychiatry and psycholo psychology um, determine the psyche as neurological processes located in the brain. The movement of neurodiversity takes up these biologicalistic and naturalistic arguments. In contrast, med scholars ignore the body and focus on med identities being constituted by psychiatric violence. And it seems to me like uh, a mad prank that the foundational book of med studies is called Mad Matters, because after being criticized for ignoring the body, Butler argues in Bodies That Matter that gender materializes through discourses, through continued repetitions of norm, norms. In their later work, Butler proposes vulnerability as the new bodily ontology that implies the rethinking of precariousness, vulnerability, injurability, 
interdependen interdependency and, and exposure. If our bodily existence makes us vulnerable, it is also linked to pain and suffering, which are processes constructed as psychic. Therefore, vulnerability is a way to understand the bodily psyche and a way to acknowledge psychic suffering without biologistic and naturalistic, therefore, psychist assumptions. I would now like to introduce you to the core elements of psychism according to the current state of my analysis. So this is work in progress. And um, for now, these are individualization, suffering, and psychic stability. Individualization is a core element of psychism as social problems and social injustice are shifted into the imaginary inner space, into the psyche. Individualization is al already anchored in the idea of the psyche as the own, the essential, that which defines the individual person. Due to their paradoxical mechanisms, all forms of discrimination have individuali individualizing and generalizing effects at the same time. Individuality is simultaneously denied and overemphasized. In the case of psychism, um, this is particularly powerful because the individual individuality is already inherent in the categorization psyche. Suffering is a core element of psychism simply because oppression causes suffering. However, the special role of suffering regarding a psychism is best understood by differentiating psychism into primary and secondary psychism. Primary psychism is uh, the oppression of um, non-normative perception, feeling, thinking, and behavior. And secondary psychism is the oppression that addresses suffering as a reaction to oppression. Um, or that addresses non-normative perception, feeling, thinking, and behavior that arises out of the, this uh, form of suffering. The th third core element of psychism is the psychic stability, which uh, refers to the counterpart emotional instability as a pathology. And I would like to thank Momo for bringing me to see the myths of psychic stability as a ma major mechanism of psychism. Psychic stability goes hand in hand with the embodiment of the psyche. This means norms materialize and harden in form of the bodily psyche. This process is reinforced on a cultural social level by the identification with psychic uh, specific sp psychic conditions. Identification means turning specific external ideas into the inner being, into the person as a whole. Having a fixed psychic identity runs the risk of becoming um, inflexible in the political strategies against psychism. But uh, to confront psychism and indeed all forms of oppression, I consider it as helpful to loosen, loosen one's identifications, to reappropriate the psychic instability, and to develop a flexible usage of the trilematic strategies against oppression. So instead of letting hegemonic ascriptions of mental states define the psyche, the psychic instability can be seen as a reappropriation of an inner space, a space from, re from where we act on the contradicting orders of oppression more flexibly. And that might even reduce suffering, not only on an individual or interpersonal level, if wanted, 
but on the levels of structure and discourse as well. So this is what I wanted to share about my theoretical work to confront psychism in the time available. And now I have to end my talk uh, with a warning. A warning about co-optation. This is, I quote uh, Penny and Prescott, a process by which a dominant group attempts to absorb or neutralize a weaker position that poses a threat to its continued power. An example for that which I find particularly impressive is the co-optation of the Mad Pride movement in Bern by psychologists and psychiatrists. So this is uh, the motto of Mad Pride originated in Toronto. Um, the right to be me, the right to be free. And this is the motto um, of the uh, Mad Pride Bern. Gemeinsam für psychische Gesundheit, which uh, means together for sanity. And I use a last gender-related analogy to make visible how very wrong this is. Because a mad pride for sanity is the equivalent to a gay pride organized by heterosexuals uh, with the motto gay pride together for heterosexuality. I hope this is obviously wrong to you and I just finish this. Uh, <laughs> Um, but when it comes to psychism, knowledge is rare and ignored. Your understandings will be very limited, although you heard my talk. Please take extra care how you confront psychism. Educate yourself about uh, co-optation and allyship. Make sure that you don't weaken the movement by co-opting emancipatory strategies. Reflect your sane privileges. There's a great um, paper by uh, Wolf Wolfram. Um, and reflect your psychist actions on all levels of oppression in your interpersonal encounters as well as institutions like academia and in discourses. Try to find analogies between anti-psychism and forms of anti-oppression um, most common to you and act accordingly. Thank you very much. <laughs>